let's start with our first question. How did I become a behavioral scientist? So the short answer is that I became so a little bit accidentally. I was a product manager and read predictably irrational and thought, wow, there's a whole science of doing this much better. Thinking as a product manager, you think a lot about behavior change. How do you get someone to do X? At least in the work that I was doing, the company that I was at, far too much intuition driven. I think this is still the case in many companies now. Um, and it turns out there's uh, shortcuts and science and behavioral insights, a whole toolkit that we can rely on um, in combination with, with research me methodologies that we can learn, test, and improve products in accordingly. Uh, but many years ago, I, I read Predictably Irrational, and one of my actual reactions was, wow, people are paid money to have fun all day. <laughs> Why? I'm doing the wrong thing. Why should I need to do this? So that's the sort of short story of it. I think one point that's actually quite relevant there is coming from a product management background. Uh, it, that, that does help me a lot now. Often I am interacting with product managers or product teams at the least. So I am, I understand their constraints. I understand their mindset, how they're measured, how they think of success. Um, and so when we're collaborating with these teams and overlaying behavioral methods on top of their existing ones, it does help have that synergy and that background of how they, they operate. The longer answer of how I became a behavioral scientist is first and foremost that I grew up moving around the world. And so I think was always very curious about nature versus, versus nurture, how much of this is cultural, how much of this is learned, um, was curious about that, majored in cultural anthropology, graduated and realized, wait, <laughs> what kind of job should I do? So started in product management. It wasn't entirely obvious what, what one does with, a, with an anthro degree, but I was interested in, in yeah, product management, marketing, had a variety of roles in that. And then gradually, as I became interested in behavioral science, figured out a path. Those were the early days, um, unclear exactly how to do that. So it took sort of creative thinking, um, being a little bit scrappy. I had a blog. Um, I worked with a professor and was sort of willing to say, hey, I I want to learn how to do this. Uh, can I can I work in this space? Met with Dan Ariely early on and asked him, do I need to get a PhD? And he asked me a lot of questions um, around what type of work I wanted to do. And it and basically gave me the advice that I did not necessarily need to if I my core interest was doing applied work. And I now share the same advice when people ask me this question as well. It really depends on what you want to do. Uh, so then for a, a number of years, I split my time working with Irrational Labs and working for Dan Ariely uh, on a variety of projects, including startups, um, and now work full-time as a managing director at Irrational Labs. This. Question number one. Yes, we answered that one. Next question. For those of you interested in working in behavioral science, what about the sectors? So let's chat about that. I think at a high level, let's do a very easy division between there's sort of the academic work, uh, staying in academia, um, you can work uh, in government and sort of the policy space, and then you can work in the private sector. So uh, Irrational Labs obviously does most of its work in the private sector, but that's sort of a first thing to kind of think about and what fits and what, what are you aligned with, what, what interests you. Another point when you're thinking about the private sector is whether you want to be in-house, so you're directly in at a company and imagine you're a behavioral scientist, or you could be also a behavioral product manager. We will link to uh, a piece that we wrote about that as well. But the point here is to think about what you might be most interested in. I, For me, I really like the variety of being a consultant and getting to work in many different sectors, many different problems, but there is something to be said about being more of a specialist than a generalist. This is probably a little bit about your personal preferences as well. Uh, many, many more companies uh, are, are hiring behavioral scientists now. So if that's of interest to you, there's certainly a lot of opportunity there.
Uh, in terms of the domains, what industries, what sectors, if you think about it for a little bit, it seems you know, obvious that there's natural fits in certain spaces. One is financial, right? Anything where there's sort of current sacrifice for future reward, behavioral science is going to be more of a fit. So financial decision-making, obvious fit, health, another obvious fit. Um, and then we at Rational Labs works a fair amount with tech more broadly as well. So those, all three of those domains have quite a lot of opportunity if you're looking at behavioral science roles. Question about the sectors. We did it. What about the skills that you need to know and really get great at as a behavioral scientist? So let's dive into this one next. The first and foremost is just very much being a master at really diving in and understanding the behavioral science principles. And specifically there, it's about the application. So, you know, I, I don't want to underemphasize under, understanding the theory in depth, certainly, and the nuance of it, absolutely critical. And what I would pair with that is just that ability to apply it. The ability, one thing I encourage people to do as they're kind of becoming or interested in be, being budding behavioral scientists, if you're interested in the applied side, you should be training your brain at all times to think about what is the application here? So you're taking an Uber to go to a meeting. You're calling an Uber. You are looking at the Uber app. What principles are they using on you right this minute? Take a screenshot of that. You should be able to very quickly identify what's going on in the screen, what principles are being used. And then you should also be thinking about well, wait, are the, is this effective? What, sh, what would I do, be doing differently? Take the screenshot, take some notes for yourself. If you were to run an intervention, uh, what would that be? If you had, let's say you just had to make, one, you got one change to do. Let's say you got three conditions to do. What are they? For each of these, you should be able to kind of articulate a theory behind why you think this change should be made. And that is such a core part of this work. If you're interested in applied work, and if you really want to get next level on it is, you know, the, the, the practical side of this is around the constraints. So great, you came up with a big swing recommendation that would completely change the design of the app. And that's wonderful. And we have those conversations with our clients sometimes like this core functionality of how you've designed this actually doesn't align with how our brains operate. And if you want to really change behavior, then do these, this one big change. A lot of times though, this also means working with constraints saying, okay, maybe in the future we can launch this big change, but for right now, these are some immediate small changes you can make. And so being able to understand and speak, speak to kind of both levels of big swing changes, completely reinventing, and that's exciting. And we should, we should push clients on that. And there's opportunity there. And then also the slightly smaller level of kind of what are immediate um, lower hanging fruit changes because imagine of course right you're putting yourself in their shoes there's engineering time that's going to take to completely reinvent this i can't put this into this next release of, of of updates but what are ideas that you can do and kind of thinking about those which ones would you push for maybe you can't make all 17 changes that you might recommend if you're going to fight for one of those which is which is that you know kind of understanding the trade-offs this is where you're taking the theory and the knowledge that you have which things you might think have the largest effects, pulling that in and you're bringing it together with the applied context um, and putting those two pieces together. So I think there's a lot of power in that. So next, there's sort of sub-specializations within that. You can get really good at, uh, we have, you know, in our team in particular, right? Folks who are even, you know, particularly strong at experimental design or particularly strong at data analysis or particularly strong even at, at mock-ups and Figma and, you know, sort of, it's wonderful to say, I have these theories and I have these ideas of how you might change it. But if you can make a Figma mock-up that can show the client very clearly, we make it come alive, you know, that's another uh, area sort of of sub-specialization within behavioral science. So this question, we done. And next question, let's talk about programs uh, to get more into behavioral economics. So it depends on the degree to which you want to make this investment and, and dive in, right? On the, on the far extreme scope, you're gonna go and get a PhD. 
Um, and by the way, if you're on the academic side and you want to transition into industry, as they say, then it's a really a question of getting more industry experience, getting more, much more applied experience. Um, but if you're on the, if you're a product manager or a marketer and you're uh, or a designer and you're interested about learning more uh, about behavioral design and applying these methodologies, then there's a whole slew of options as well. So at you know, a simple a kind of uh, initial level, we have a boot camp. Uh, we have actually several different levels of boot camp. The, there's sort of this self directed where you have access to the content. Uh, the website, by the way, for this is bebootcamp.com. Very simple. Um, so, self directed, uh, where you get access to the content yourself. And then we also have cohorts, cohorts starting in July, um, and we have them every few months where these are live lectures, you have access to a Slack channel, you have access to kind of a community of folks, uh, office hours with behavioral scientists and uh, a, a learn by doing model. And then there's wonderful programs out there. So there's like year long programs, we check out Penn, we check out LSE, um, where you're doing certainly much more in depth that, than you're kind of quitting your existing job and, and doing a program for a year. So it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, but it's sort of an array of options uh, out there for you. Uh, I guess with that, I will close with sort of best wishes on your journey. Behavioral science is a uh, fun and meaningful uh, space that you can, can really uh, initiate change. And so, uh, yeah, I, I wish you luck. I, I, I'm very biased, but uh, I think it's a wonderful wonderfully fun career and uh, look forward to having you join me on this journey.